You see a man running down the street. He's running towards a bus stop as a bus is approaching. He desperately waves at the bus, but the bus does not stop. The man stands at the bus stop, looking at the disappearing bus, then at his watch, and then at the timetable. In the absence of evidence to the contrary, you may think it's perfectly reasonable to infer that the man wanted to catch the bus. Your friend is telling you a story. The story seems unlikely. You question her about it. And it turns out that the story was not about her, it was about her friend. Indeed, on further questioning, you find out that her friend had actually been recounting a story that their friend had read in a book. The greater the distance from the original source, the less weight you apply to the account, if indeed you apply any weight to it at all. You are unwell. You visit your doctor. She prescribes you medication, which you take. You accept her expertise. You place reliance and trust upon it. Again, this is totally reasonable. But your confidence in her expertise is restricted to that field, namely medicine. You would not, for example, have the same degree of confidence in her ability to fly a plane. You are listening to an account given by someone who you know has lied to you many times before. You doubt what he is saying, and the fact that he has lied to you so many times before affects your confidence in what he is saying. These scenarios are but a few examples of how the human mind functions on a daily basis, namely the way in which we automatically, and on the whole subconsciously, assess information and make judgments, using our instinct, intuition and reason. They are also matters that are reflected in the laws of evidence applicable in any advanced legal system. For example, regarding scenario 1, the man catching the bus. The example I've used is one that I've heard several judges use to instruct a jury about the difference between legitimate and illegitimate inferences that can be drawn from the evidence. The inference that I've suggested, namely that the man wanted to catch a bus, is a legitimate inference. But there are limits. For example, it would be unreasonable to seek to infer from the evidence provided the purpose of the man's journey, or, for example, what stop he would get off at. Regarding second, third or fourth hand accounts, commonly referred to as hearsay evidence, in very general terms such evidence is normally excluded, as it is not possible to test the original source of the information. With regard to experts and their entitlement to give evidence, again there are many rules as to who qualifies as an expert, and what topics they are an expert on, and what are they entitled to give evidence about. And finally, with regard to credibility of witnesses, and their propensity to lie, again, this is a factor that a court would normally take into account. The laws of evidence that I have referred to are no more than the common sense reflection and application of the sort of rules by which we conduct our lives. However, there are some people who have an ability to apply a totally different set of standards to one particular aspect of their beliefs and behaviour. I am talking, of course, about the religious and the standards that they apply to the question of the existence of their particular flavour of God. Take, for example, the question of inferences. How many times have you heard the argument, Look around you, everything is so beautiful, there must be a God. Or, Look how well the universe is tuned, there must be a God. Not only are these inferences totally invalid, the additional inference that they seek to draw namely that that God must be their particular God, is so far beyond unreasonable that it borders on the insane, ludicrous and laughable. Take the more sophisticated version, the Kalam cosmological argument, which, if you're not familiar with it, runs along these lines. Everything that exists must have a cause. The universe exists and therefore must have a cause. And the inference... God caused the universe to exist. Even if you were to accept the first two propositions, the inference is an example of a leap of faith, not logic or reason. Secondly, take the question of second or third hand accounts, hearsay. Again, in this regard, the religious, who otherwise would have no problem whatsoever with rejecting this type of evidence or applying little weight to it, when it comes to their particular good book, have no problem whatsoever offloading their normal standards of evidence and reason. They consider it perfectly acceptable to place reliance on a 2,000-year-old story, evidenced in a 400-year-old book, if you take the King James Version as gospel, the origins of which are uncertain, unprovably contradictory. And they accept this on the basis of such reasoning as 
Well, the authors say they were divinely inspired, so they must have been. I kid you not, I've heard this argument being advanced. Imagine what would happen if you were to suggest to them that Rawling said that she was inspired when she was writing the Harry Potter books, and therefore Hogwarts must exist. They would laugh at you, and yet they can't seem to understand why non-believers laugh at them. And even more ironically, they have no problem discounting other religions, even though the evidence in support of those other religions is no different from the evidence in support of theirs. In relation to expert evidence, and the reliance placed upon experts, again, the religious show a remarkable ability to discount such evidence when it suits them. Although they will happily accept all the benefits and comforts that scientific advancement has afforded them, they will equally willingly reject similar evidence in those areas that interfere with their beliefs, most notably in relation to evolution. Ask these people why they reject such evidence, and you are likely to hear responses such as this. Well, the scientific community is not in agreement and therefore can't be trusted. How ironic! when there are over 30,000 denominations of Christianity alone, a level of diversity of opinion that you will not find in any area of science, let alone evolutionary theory. Alternatively, when you ask that question, you may hear a response such as, well, I've looked at the internet for the last two years, and in doing so, have become an expert in all areas of science. Well, that's great, Sporty. But let me ask you, would you undergo an operation if the surgeon said to you, I've no formal qualifications and I've never performed an operation before. In fact, I've got no experience as being a doctor before, but I've read a lot about it on the internet. Would you get on a plane knowing that the pilot has never flown before, but has read a lot about being a pilot on the internet? Finally, in relation to credibility, how often do we hear the argument that the Bible contains scientific foreknowledge? despite the fact that these arguments are tragically convoluted and desperate. But let's assume that there is some truth in the Bible. That fact does not allow for the argument that it is therefore true in all regards, particularly when so many parts of it are provably wrong. In short, the religious apply a totally different standard of evidence and reason in regard to that one aspect of their lives. And it's an important one seeing as how it supposedly affects all aspects of their life and behaviour. To highlight this point, imagine how some of their arguments would be received in a court of law in front of a reasonable jury. For, look at the beauty of the world, there must be a God. Read, look at the defendant. He looks guilty, he must be. Or, for, I just know I'm right and there is a God. Read, I have no evidence whatsoever against defendant, but I know he's guilty. Alternatively, for the religious that is, imagine that you are a defendant and someone is giving evidence against you, an expert witness, an expert witness who states that your DNA was found at the murder scene and implicates you. Would you consider it relevant for the jury to know that this expert in fact had no qualifications whatsoever and didn't even know what the letters DNA stood for? If you are religious and still watching this video, you may want to consider these points. Not only because it may enlighten you, but also, from a selfish point of view, it will stop me having to make videos like this, pointing out the fallacies of your arguments. Arguments that you would never accept in any other area of your life. Arguments which are transparently and embarrassingly worthless.